Hi, this is the second part of the, um, the walkthrough of the first AAT sample assessment. So we're looking at tasks five, six, seven and eight. So task five is for 10 marks. So this is about control accounts, reconciliations and using journals to correct accounts. So space, etc., sells posters of images from space. The receivables ledger at the 30th of June shows the following balances are due from customers. If the receivables ledger control account and receivables ledger reconcile, what will be the debit balance? Right, so these are all customer names. These are all the total amounts that they owe. So to answer this question, we have to add up all six of these numbers. So luckily I've prepared one earlier and know that that comes to this number here. 414635. The balance on the receivables ledger control account is a debit balance of £40,585.70. So that's showing less than in the receivables ledger. What is the difference? So again, an easy question, just one number take away the other. And then the not so easy bit. Identify whether or not the following statements could explain the difference between the two balances. Right, so a customer who is in credit having overpaid a previous bill has not been included in the list of customers in the receivables ledger. Right, so this is the receivables ledger figure. So if someone was in credit that we've forgotten about them, we would have subtracted from this, which would have brought this number more in line with what's in the RLCA. So yes, that could explain the difference. A discount allowed was recorded on the debit side of the customer account in the receivables ledger. Right, so a discount allowed should have been on the credit side because it reduces the amount the customer owes, it reduces the asset. So it's gone on the wrong side. So that would mean that we were showing that people owed us too much in the receivables ledger. And, that, and that's, that's what has happened because that figure, the 41426, is bigger. So that could also explain the difference, possibly. The cash book at the end of June shows a debit balance of £8332.18. There it is. The following differences have been identified between the cash book and the balance in the bank statement. So before I read through all them, I'm looking to complete the adjustments to the cash book by selecting items from the pick list and entering figures in either the debit or the credit column. Right, so the bank statement includes some direct debits that are not included in the cash book. So they're not in the cash book, so they're going to have to go in. They are an electricity direct debit of £187.12 and a mobile phone direct debit of 67 So if we add both of those together, we know that we've got a further payment coming out that has to be recorded in the cash book direct debits. The cash book includes a check, not yet on the bank statement. Well, it, it's already in here, so I'm not going to do anything with that. The bank has charged the business £12 in bank charges. So again, that's more that has to come out. £12 on the credit side, bank charges. The cash book includes a customer receipt of 102, not yet in the bank statement. So again, it's in here already, so I don't need to worry about that. So I've just given us a few red herrings there. 
Space, etc., have produced their year end trial balance and have identified the following error. A new computer was purchased for long term use in the business. This has been debited to repairs and maintenance. So, computer, of course, is a non current asset. Repairs and maintenance is an expense. So, it's in the wrong account and it's in the wrong ballpark. So, it's got an error of principle. Identify the impact on the suspense account of correcting this error. Well, it'll be nothing because I know that my core COP errors, errors which are not revealed by the trial balance, don't need a suspense account, so no effect. Task six, about the principles of contract law. Identify whether the following statements relate to criminal or civil law. These cases are dealt with in the county court. Right, so the county court is civil law. It goes county court and then high court. Criminal is pretty much magistrates and then crown court. The burden of proof lies with the prosecution. So that's criminal law. It's the Crown Prosecution Service decides if there's enough evidence to bring a case. Um, and they have to basically show that that person did it. Identify whether the following situations create a binding contract. You and a friend each buy a lottery ticket and agree to equally share the winnings if either wins. Right, so that there's no intention to create legal relations because it's friends. Remember, a, a binding contract, you need agreement, which is the offer plus the acceptance. You need consideration, which is some value exchanging hands. And you need intention to create. So this one will be does not. You are the last person to raise your hand during an auction before the auctioneer's hammer hits the table. Yes, that does create a binding contract because all three things are there. You know, you know, by raising your hand that you are accepting. Um, no, hang on. By raising your hand during an auction, would you be making the offer and then his hammer accepts that offer? I think that would be the way of looking at it. Um, there's going to be an agreed price and there's definitely an intention to create. You send an email to confirm you want to buy a car you saw in your local garage. So you're making an offer, but there's no acceptance yet, so it does not create a binding contract. You enter into a contract to buy goods, but the contract is breached. This has caused you to lose money and you would like to make a claim against the seller. True or false regarding the breach of contract. If a breach of contract foreseeably causes economic loss, damages will generally compensate. Yes, so damages is basically getting money to put you back to where you would have been. If the contract states the amount of damage is payable if the contract has breached, this will always be the amount paid. Not necessarily, because then what would be the point in going to court? So false for that one. Right, task seven. So this is the other question on this exam where you are expected to write. Um, and we are looking at eight marks, I think. Uh, yeah, eight marks altogether on this task will be written. So the task is about bookkeeping systems, receipts and payments, and the importance of information and data security. Marco runs a small marketing business. He has two members of staff, John and Janita. They all visit clients, but make sure there is always one person in the office at all times. Marco has one computer, which all three members of staff use. The password is 123456, so that it is easy for everyone to remember. State 
three risks to the business from using a shared computer with this password? Well, I think we can say that um, it could easily be hacked as the password is predictable. All right, so that's one. Um, I think that's a fairly obvious one. Um, all three members of staff are using it. So might not be someone from outside. It could be um, confidential information is visible to all three staff members. Could be a problem. Um, That could be a risk or could be a breach of GDPR, which is the data protection legislation. Uh, let's have a look and see what they've gone for. So they've said one mark for reference to the following. Um, they've said shared computer means that all staff members have access to all the business information, including financial data, employee data, customer data, and perhaps Marco's personal data. So I just put that there. So maybe that needed to be beefed up a bit. Could result in breaches of confidentiality. They've put that as a second point. Could result in theft or fraud, especially if banking details are on the computer. Third parties could easily guess the password, so vulnerable to external fraud. Customer supplier employee details stored, there could be a breach of data protection law if it is not stored securely. So I think I would take away from that that perhaps my answers were a little too brief. So, I mean, do have a look obviously at the AAT suggested answers as well. Marco does not really know whether the business has done well until the accounts are prepared at the end of each year. He would like to understand how the business is doing throughout the year and perhaps be able to set targets for John and Janita. Identify which characteristic of useful information is missing from Marco's current financial information. So the clue is that he doesn't know whether the business has done well until the accounts are prepared at the end of the year. So the problem is he hasn't got the information on time. So reliable is about, you know, is it accurate? Can you use it to make decisions? So we can, but not until it's too late. Is it consistent? Well, presumably if he's doing it year on year and understandable again, yes, but just doesn't have it on time. Identify which one of the following types of information would be most useful to Marco to achieve his goal setting targets. Um, so his goal setting targets. Um, setting them targets. So the budgetary information would be good because you set a budget and then see if they manage to meet that budget or not. And then obviously, you know, that's that's a good target and a good review of whether they've been successful. None of the others really sort of lend themselves to target setting. So again, I'm just going to check that. Is, yeah, that is what they were after there. Marco is considering moving on to a cloud-based accounting system, pardon me, as he has been told that this will allow him to monitor business performance throughout the year. He has been told that this will automatically complete the transfer of data from the books of prime entry to the ledgers, that it automatically completes the transfer of data into the control accounts, and that it also automatically reconciles the payables and receivables ledgers to their respective control accounts. So that just means to the PLCA and to the RLCA. Marco does not understand what this means. Describe the differences between a manual recording process and a digital recording process 
using the example of sales to customers. You must include the use of books of prime entry, the receivables ledger, and the receivables ledger control account. Uh, this is five marks. So how best to approach this? Um, I think to keep it simple, I would describe how a manual process works and then a separate paragraph on how the digital process works. But you could, of course, sort of talk about each stage and make the comparison as you went along. So it just depends on how you prefer to write this, I think. So um, if it was me, just to be sort of very clear and sort of obvious what I was doing, I would even put a heading, manual system. Um, so where do we start? We write the sales invoices into a sales day book analyzed between the net, VAT and total figures. And then what do we do? Um, the sales day book is totaled and the total figures for each column are posted to the general ledger so we could explain what happens we debit the rlca we credit the vat and we credit the sales we could even show which one's which here i hope we were feeling clever um the individual sales invoice totals are posted to the receivables ledger. Um, which contains the accounts for each individual customer that we um, will do. Um, <clears throat> a reconciliation will be performed at the end of the month to check that the sum of the ledger balances from the receivables ledger is equal to the closing balance from the receivables ledger control account. I find that easier to just boop, 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 like give the steps and then go on to a cloud based system. Um, so the net sales, um, let's see, invoices could be produced on the system and automatically posted um, invoices could be entered but only the net amount is typed in and the system automatically calculates the VAT based on the tax code within the system, currently 20%. So the system will add the VAT. Um, the system will post each invoice total automatically to the customer's account in the receivables ledger. It will also automatically post 
the details of the invoice to the RLCA sales and VAT accounts. Therefore, the receivables ledger and RLCA are automatically reconciled. There cannot be a difference. This does not necessarily mean they are both accurate as an invoice could have been entered incorrectly at the start or missed out. Right, so I'm not saying it's brilliant, but I'd be confident that would get me five marks. Describe, not analyze. It's not saying, I mean, in a way, I've done a little bit of analysis at the bottom. I might not even need that last sentence. It's just describe the differences. So by describing one and then the other, I think it's fair to say the differences will be there. Um, again, I'm not going to read it all out, but I do have a look at the mark scheme. And in fact, they have set it out like that. They've given a maximum three marks for talking about the manual, a maximum of three marks for talking about the digital. And obviously it's only five marks total. So should be able to pick up the marks on a question like that. Quite likely the real exam will have a very similar question, but using purchases to, um, from suppliers. So you would have to write something very similar, but based on um, the PLCA and the payables ledger. That would be my guess. Right, on to the final question, task eight for 14 marks about the external business environment. So Globe Limited are expanding their business to take advantage of opportunities in countries other than the UK, as they want to make sure they continue to increase profits every year. Which statement best explains globalization? Well, globalization is about going around the globe, with being worldly, sort of trading with other countries. So which best explains? Globalization means buying goods from an overseas customer, possibly, but it doesn't seem like a brilliant explanation. Globalization means operating internationally at all levels of the business. I like that much better. Globalization means employing staff from different countries. So I think one and three are sort of possible aspects of it. But that middle one sort of encompasses what we actually mean by the term. Identify whether the following statements about business and risk are true or false. A business exists only to make a profit. Most businesses do exist, that's their primary objective but they do have other objectives as well. And of course you do get not-for-profit businesses. So false. A business takes risk to make a profit. Yes, there's always risk involved with setting up a business. You've invested money. What if it all goes wrong or you get hit by a COVID epidemic or something like that? Uncertainty means the same as risk. I want to say false. So if something's uncertain. It's not necessarily risky. So you could be uncertain whether you want bacon or sausages for dinner, but it's not necessarily a risk. So no, I don't think that they are the same thing. Identify the statement which explains what happens when there is deflation. So inflation, we know, is when prices keep going up and up. Deflation is when prices are coming down. Explains what happens when there is deflation. So do interest rates keep rising? 
No, we're seeing at the moment, aren't we? Interest rates are going up and up to try and curb inflation. So it'd be the opposite. So it can't be that one. Um, prices fall temporarily. It could be because deflation is prices going down. The value of money increases continually. So if prices are going down and you're holding your same hundred pounds in your hand, you can obviously buy more with that money. So I quite like that one. I think I'm ruling this one out because it's not temporary. Deflation implies prices are kind of continually on the low. So again, let me just check. Yeah, that is the correct answer. Identify whether the following statements are likely to cause an increase in demand for a luxury product. Right, so there is a general increase in household income. Well, yeah, if you've got more money, then you're going to go out and buy more luxuries. The cost of raw materials used to make the product is reduced. So the cost of raw materials go down. It could mean that the business passes on that saving and therefore the item becomes cheaper and therefore there is more demand. But that's maybe one step removed from what it said here. Yeah, so they've gone with no increase. So we've got to just take it at face value. The cost of raw materials, we can't assume that there's a knock-on effect on the price. Could just be that the business makes more profit. The average price of products increases. Well, that would make the demand fall, if anything, which isn't an option. So there's certainly not going to be an increase in demand if the price is going up. The government is concerned about the rise in unemployment in young people. They have a number of options they can take but have communicated to the public they will not be increasing rates of tax. Identify the statement which explains what tax is. Well, tax is money taken off us by the government. Um, so a financial charge made by a business, no. A financial contribution made by the government to businesses, <laughs> no. A financial charge made by the government, yes. Identify whether the following taxes are direct or indirect. So direct tax is where um, the person or the business pays it straight over to HMRC, the government. An indirect tax is where it's collected by somebody else. So VAT is often known as an indirect tax. And in fact, the old level three unit was actually called indirect tax because what happens with VAT is the business charges the customer the VAT and then pays that over to HMRC. So the final consumer is paying the tax, the, the customer but the business is collecting that tax and paying it to HMRC on their behalf. Um, the other two, both direct, because corporation tax is a tax on the business's profits paid directly from the business to the government. And national insurance is, you, you know, that we have employee and employer national insurance whenever someone works for a business. And both of those are paid directly um, so national insurance taken at source from the employee and um, the employer national insurance added to that, both of them will be paid directly over to HMRC. Identify two key principles of an effective tax system. Wow. Um, so economy. Collecting money to use for public services. 
So I'm thinking it's that. Empathy. Empathy is about understanding other people's points of view. I don't think the tax system cares too much, so probably not. Ease. I'm torn. It should be easy because otherwise people won't pay. I might, if I was doing this, I'd probably put ease and equity, but I'm looking at the answer and they have gone for economy, so not ease. But definitely equity, because equity means fairness. And what we have um, is what's known as a progressive tax system. So people with lower incomes pay a lower proportion of their tax. So you, you'd be aware that the, the tax system for income tax starts at 20% and then moves up to 40 and then 45%. So people with higher earnings end up paying a higher proportion of their earnings as tax. So for that reason, it's deemed to be equitable. Okay, and that concludes, oh, I forgot to see how long it had taken me. So bear in mind what I said, that it doesn't mark at all task four and task seven. So you're certainly gonna have to take photos um, and check your answers. And then at the end, you can add these up. As you can see, it's only gonna be out of 68. Just double check that. So 10, 13, 14, 10, 7, and another 14. Yeah, it's out of 68. Okay.